Coming up on today's two-hour show, we talk about all things Bronco. This week was the debut of the all-new retro-looking Bronco. It's pretty cool. We've got the scoop. Inside our new car showroom today, Chevy Silverado and the Ram Rebel Diesel. We'll give you an in-depth review of each. We've got this week's automotive news and our weekly Ram tracks and Jeep trails features. Conrad has his Conrad's Car Clinic. And we also have a few surprises for you as well. All that and more just ahead on today's two-hour in-wheel time car show for Saturday, July 18th, 2020. Howdy. Along with Mike out of this world, Mars, King Conrad DeLong, Don Armstrong here. So glad that you could join us today. And uh, I have to tell you a little story before we actually get going at the show this morning. And that is is that Mr. Mars has uh, acquired a whole array. <laughs> I mean, a whole video array here that we've been working, well, they've been working on for two hours to get ready. Well, guess what? We're using the old cameras. <laughs> We're using everything old. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll be we able need to. to go. I, gotta bring, I forgot to bring a grandchild with me to show us how to make it all work. Well, there is that element that we're missing. Yes. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but anyway, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned to you, it's Bronco Day because uh, Ford Motor Company debuted the all-new Bronco. And I really like the way that they went about it. Yes. Uh, the whole social media thing. And then they also did it in commercials as well on broadcast television on the Din Disney uh, Building uh, the buzz. Building the buzz. And boy, I'll tell you what, that buzz started building before... And then on Monday night was the big debut, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and it just keeps multiplying because all of the writers now are all into it. And um, we thought we'd start this morning talking about a little bit about Bronco history. And uh, so we reached out to a fellow by the name of Todd Zerker, and Todd is on the line with us right now. Todd, good morning. Good morning. So glad that you could join us. He's uh, joining us from Phoenix, Arizona. And Todd... Uh, has a book called Ford Bronco, A History of Ford's Legendary 4x4. And it really is legendary. And, you know, like most manufacturers, Todd, kind of felt like they abandoned us all. But they also changed the Bronco from its original beginnings and then turned it into a truck platform and not its own platform. And it just kind of lost its appeal. And then, of course... <clears throat> O.J. Simpson kind of ruined it for everybody. <laughs> and then it had this stigma about it. But Ford has gone back to the original Bronco, and that's what your book is all about. So one, instead of me telling us about it, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so my book, unfortunately, came out a couple years ago, so it doesn't have any of the 2021 stuff in it, but it does cover the uh, five previous generations, starting with the early Bronco that came out back in 1966. And, uh, you know, Ford, Ford back in the early 60s knew that uh, the SUV market was going to start growing. Um, last year, I, I saw recently that SUV sales for the last year were about 12 million vehicles um, this past year. And back in, to put some context in that, back in 1960, the total SUV market in the U.S. was about 30,000 vehicles. So you can see how things have grown. Um, the Ford built Jeeps in the Army for the Army back in World War II. Right. Um, and those those surplus Jeeps came back to the to the States and, and XGIs bought them, other people bought them, started recreating with them, using for hunting, fishing, exploring, um, snow plow vehicles, and so on. And so people really started to to get into the into the bron into the excuse me, not the Broncos yet, but the Jeeps, and then later the Scouts. And uh, and so Ford saw that market coming in the early 60s. They did a whole bunch of surveys with, with uh, consumers that had those other four-wheel drives. And they said, well, what do, you, what, do, what do you want a new in a new SUV and a new four-wheel drive? And so people said, well, you know, the, the GIs were getting to be in their 30s and 40s. By then, they wanted a little more comfort. And so they wanted roll-up things that we take for granted today, like maybe roll-up windows and doors and windshield wipers and maybe even a radio and a heater would be nice and something the interstate was being interstate highway system was being built so they said well let's maybe something that could go faster than 45 or 50 miles an hour and so ford took all that together and and came out with the bronco in uh august 11th of 1965 and it was it was also an immediate hit uh the uh <clears throat> The press release for that was a little different than what we saw Monday night, but it was it was also a pretty big deal. So, Todd, I have to butt in here and ask you, was the original Bronco built on its own platform? 
Uh, yes, it was. <clears throat> although they, although they did, although people realize, people don't realize that they did dip into the Ford parts bin for a lot of the parts. Um, you can see elements of the Ford pickups in the body sides on the on the fender openings, rear fender openings. Uh, the the front seats were from a Mustang. Uh, the engine was from the Ford Econoline. So it it was its very unique own frame and, and chassis, but they did reuse a lot of Ford parts from their existing vehicles to, to put it all together. How long was that first model? How long did that last? That that la that lasted from 1966 to 1977. So it had a, wow. it had a long run. Yeah. And, and yeah. That's, that's really, in my view, the iconic Bronco was the original, yes. what I call the short wheelbase, the small truck, which... If I kind of read the history correctly, Ford really did take a pretty good look at the International Scout as they developed the Bronco because the Scout was out five years earlier. What did it yeah. come out in 01? Yeah. In 61? Yeah, Scout, yeah, Scout came out in 61. And so, yeah, it's it's a very, very valid uh, point to say that Ford looked leaned very heavily on what, what International had done with the Scout, for sure. But they did a much better job of it. Because that you know you talked earlier about they wanted a vehicle that would go more than sixty miles an hour and and a scout I don't think would go even close to sixty miles an hour in some instances. <laughs> well, it was it was a little bit it, it was a little bit better and, and Ford Ford debuted their their coil spring front suspension. You know the Jeeps and the the Jeeps and the Scouts had had four leaf springs on them all the way around right. and and of course so that they didn't ride real well and then the coil spring front suspension the way Ford configured it. They had a real tight turning radius. That was a big selling point. If you're on some narrow mountain trail, you don't want to do a 21 point turn to get around that, that tight <laughs> yeah. corner. Um, and and they did some other things too. You know, technical wise, they they had what they called a through drivetrain. So instead of splitting a bunch of gears in the transfer case, it could just go straight through. So you didn't have as much gear whine, um, and and uh, a few other things like that that they did that really made them pretty nice vehicles. It became, now, yeah, it became more sophisticated. So let's move yeah. on now to the second phase of the Bronco. And so that was uh, from, what, 78 on? Yeah, just seven, 78, 79 were the second generation. And Ford had actually started working on that many years earlier. A lot of people don't realize that. But, you know, the, the Blazer came along in 69, and by two or three years later, the Blazer was – handily outselling the Bronco. You could get automatic transmission, disc brakes, air conditioning. It was, again, it was much more was, civilized. Yeah, it was much more civilized. And so the Bronco was, was kind of falling behind. So they worked on it. They expected that they would release that in 74, but then that pesky thing called the oil embargo and the resulting economic downturn for several years there, they said, you know what, let's just milk this old platform for a few more years. So 78, 79, those were then were built on the, uh, F series uh, F one hundred and fifty chassis and looked like the pickups much more comfortable and those were those two years seventy eight and seventy nine were the best selling years of the Bronco nineteen seventy nine really? was the only yeah seventy nine was the only year that the Bronco ever sold over a hundred thousand units in one in one year and, so and the first uh, gens generally were twenty to twenty thousand per year correct exactly right yeah they varied from fifteen to twenty three twenty four so they were always a they were a solid seller, but they were they were fairly low numbers. But but you know, if you, Ford, if, Ford, yeah, go ahead. They, but they did it for like eleven years on that first gen, right? About eleven, twelve yeah. years. So there's there's well, like well, two or three hundred thousand of them, but those things are hard to find. A lot of them, yeah. They they like a lot of other early vehicles uh, uh, succumbed early to the tin worm in a lot of parts of the country. Uh -huh. So. Um, even, even those, you know, even those that live out of those of us that live out West where they don't salt the roads, a lot of those trucks, uh, if they weren't beat to death off road, they did have a lot of rust issues. Okay. So, but, but that yeah. again was the passion for the first gen is, you know, you look at Baja, you look at, uh, core, a lot of that real high level off road stuff. There were so many first gen Broncos of the privateers running those vehicles because, you could put power in them. They were very dependable, and you could get places with them you couldn't get with a full-size truck. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. Uh, a real strong part of the Bronco legacy for many people, including myself, is its off-road racing heritage, and that started early with uh, right after the Bronco, with the first gen was was introduced when uh, Bill Strop in Southern California 
uh, got some Broncos and put together a race team. And then he was very successful, brought some big marquee names in like uh, Parnelli Jones and James Garner and others. And, and really, you know, Bill Strop was, was to Broncos is what Carroll Shelby was to Mustangs. And so he, he really, that, that off-road racing heritage really has played a huge role in the Broncos history for sure. So what do you think about the new Bronco? I, I know that you've probably dug into it and, and, and know about as much as everybody else does. What do you think about the look uh, and, and the target that the Ford is trying to reach? I, well, I, you know, of course I'm biased, but, but I love it. Um, I think they hit a home run with it. Um, it, it it's it, the, of course, I, I see a lot of the positive such stuff on social media about it, but the, the buzz is something that I have not seen in a vehicle introduction in many, many, many years. And I agree. Um, totally. I totally, these totally agree. With all these reservations and, uh, you know, their Ford server crashing because they couldn't get all the reservations taken care of. Um, <laughs> you know, people, people, of course, come up and talk to me because they know I'm a Bronco guy and, you know, d- d- want to talk about it and all these articles. And, you know, I think it'll die down a little bit, of course, but people are, it's, it's been gone for so long and, and Ford, got the right people involved and they had the good des- good design parameters and they I think they've got a hit on their hands. What really do you think did. about the engines that they've chosen to go in the in, in in the actual off-roader? I'm not talking about the Bronco Sport which is really a crossover vehicle. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about the the ones that that actually relate to the first gen. Um, I think I think I think they'll be okay. You know, there's always the naysayers. That, oh, it doesn't have a five way. It doesn't have a V8, and it doesn't have a solid front axle in it. But um, being a history guy, I always like to look back and say, "Hey, guys, let's look at comparison here. Of what we're getting with the the 2.7, the EcoBoost, whether it's a four cylinder or the or the or the V6. You know, look back to when we were driving our, our early Broncos, the first generation trucks. Those things were so smogged down in the 70s that the V8 had, <laughs> I think, at, at its lowest point in 1975, it had a whopping 122 horsepower. <laughs> and now and now we have a four cylinder. Um, you know, they're different horsepower and torque curves, of course. But now we have a four cylinders that are that are putting out well over 200 horsepower. The V6 is over well over 300 and 400 foot pounds of torque. Um, you know, maybe other than the noise, what's not to like, really? Right. Uh, I, I think they're going to do great. And and these engines have been used on other platforms. You know, the 2.7 is has a, a good track record now in an F-150. They're, they're introducing a new vehicle, but these these powertrains, these but the f- these engines have been in service for a long time. Right. So they, they have a good track record. Yeah, the foundation of the powertrain is well proven over time. The other thing I really love is that they did bring back a visual of the Gen 1, and I love the fact that you can take the doors off and store them in the vehicle. I don't know why you would want to, but you can. Well, it's just just like today, uh, if you be driving over here in the sunshine, and if I wanted to take the doors off for the day and not leave them at home because it rained on the way over here and I would have got wet, but now that I'm here, I could take them off right around town all day, put them back on, and hit the highway. Yeah, have them with you. Very very creative. yeah, I think that was a, I think the door thing in particular was a real jab at Jeep uh, because you know <laughs> Jeeps you can take the doors off too, but you got to leave them at home in your garage. And and if you if you're not carrying a lot in the back of the Bronco, you put your doors back there. And like Mike said, you know if the rain rain comes up or or something changes with the weather, it's like oh, I think I'm going to put the doors back on. And you just go around back and grab the doors and stop in it. Stop in at Bucky's so, and put the doors on. So Todd, I have to ask you. Did you put your hundred dollars down? <laughs> I did. I did. I, uh, <laughs> you and a million other people. Yeah, it took it took me till eleven o'clock Monday night. And I kept getting all these errors, you know, and I'm like, oh man, what's going on here? And so I just kept trying, and finally, right before I went to bed, I I got through, and uh, so yeah, I put. I'm I'm married with a family, and so um, if we get a Bronco. It's it's going to be a four door. Um, I do have a I do have a two door. Um, early Bronco out in my garage, but you know, they're, they're a little harder to get into and they aren't a whole lot of fun to drive around when it's 110 out. So uh, <laughs> four door, four door fits the, fits the bill nicely for me, I think. So let's talk a little bit about your book before we let you go at uh, the history of Ford's legendary four by four available on Amazon. I understand. You can get it on Amazon and, and various other outlets, but Amazon's the easiest to find. Yep. Yep. 
have you had a lot of success with it? Yeah, I think I have. I even got invited to a great uh, radio show in Texas because of it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, oh, let no, us know I, who that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, no seriously, it's it's done well. It's been out for just over a year. Uh, it's already in its second printing, and um, so very I, nice. I corrected, a, yeah, I corrected a few of the errors, and um, it's it's been doing well, and and I've been really been pleased with the people's reception. Well, it looks like so. you're going to have to do it again with an addition onto it about the new Bronco as soon as you get it. Yeah, we've we've talked about that with my editor, and and there was originally talk that we were trying to get that into the first edition, but obviously that didn't happen. But that gives us a chance to to revise it and do a second edition or write another book. And, well, there and you hopefully, go. and hopefully you'll see a little bit of a surge or a decent sized surge with the introduction of the Bronco and people starting to Google Bronco, and uh, and your book's going to pop up in front of them as well. Yeah, I'm, that's that's what I'm hoping for. Well, yep. Todd, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Stay cool out there in Phoenix, and we look <laughs> forward to uh, reading your book, and we look forward to getting your review as soon as you take delivery on your new Bronco. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, man. Thank you. Talk to you soon. That's Todd Zerker. The book is called Ford Bronco, A History of Ford's Legendary 4x4. All right, a review of the Chevy Silverados coming up next on the In-Wheel Time Car Show right after this quick break. Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stone? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit? It's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is, your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high, get a DUI. Paid for by NHTSA. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for today's In Wheel Time Car Show. We appreciate you staying with us. And, um, you know, this show airs every Saturday live from 10 a.m. to noon Central Time. And we invite you, if you're just tuning in, to join us every Saturday. Time now for this hour's car review. Mr. Mars has a look at the Chevy Silverado. Yes, I did. The 2020 Silverado Crew Cab RST two-wheel drive. A lot of the vehicles we've been getting the last uh, year or so, four-wheel drive. Uh, I guess it's you know because of the cheapness of it. But anyway, this and the reason they've gone the two-wheel drive, I believe, is because the RST package is more of a performance package. Now this is a full-size pickup. Uh, it comes in. You can get three different cab styles. Got eight different trim levels, and RST is the performance trim level. So um, what? Basically, the Silverado was all redone in 2019, so 2020, they've added some, tweaked a few things, they've uh, added a bed camera, they've added some uh, tie-downs inside the bed, and some different other camera views that you can get with uh, the trailer and package, it's all kinds of options, but uh, to look at the outside of it up front, we're going to find that the RST has the LED lighting package all the way around and on the interior. It's got a body color styling theme, so there's really no much, not much chrome to it. And uh, when you get into the bed area, that's where you're going to find the bed lighting. It's got 12 different tie-downs on it with power outlets back there. Got a rear corner bumper step that's uh, real popular with GM products right now. And it happens to roll on some 20-inch aluminum wheels. And, and package it all together, and it's got a nice, big, bold look to it. Uh, the shoulder line on it's a little bit taller, and it, it just looks a little bit bigger. Now, you get inside of it, got leather seating on this particular model with the front are heated, front bucket seats are heated, the rear is a 60-40 folding seat, and it's got a flat floor in the back of it, which is really nice for cargo. has the 8-inch touchscreen that's in the dash, so that's where you're going to find your Apple CarPlay, your Android, your, your HD rear vision camera that's all packaged in there as part of it, and your convenience controls are all there, your, your Bose premium audio sound is there, uh, it's even got a rear power sliding glass in that you can use them from that point. 
So it's got a lot of features right in there in that dash. All the switches are nice and big. So if you happen to be wearing gloves, that's one thing I really liked about it is you can easily do that uh, if you're in the cold or wearing work gloves or anything like that. Now, under the hood, there are six engine and transmission combinations available in the Chevrolet Silverado. We had the 5.3 liter Eco Diesel or Ecotech V8, 355 horsepower at 5,600 RPM, 383 pound feet of torque, and an eight speed automatic transmission. There is a separate 5.3 liter that's matted, matched to a 10 speed automatic transmission that uh, it's the same basic engine, but it's configured differently for that transmission. Now, if you properly equip this vehicle, you can tow 13,400 pounds. Now, it will haul, this is a half ton truck, 2,250 pounds properly equipped. You know, we're talking a ton here into a half ton truck. Uh, a lot of them have gone that way, so it's you got to kind of think about that when you go to buy these things. EPA says in the city you're looking at 17 miles to the gallon. You should be looking for 23 out on the highway combined for 19. You got? We got over 300 miles on it. We got right at 18 and a half miles to the gallon. Okay. So it, it does really well out on the highway considering what trucks used to do. Now, I did like the, the, the way it ran, the, the nice RPM range that it had because it had it with the 8-speed, it shifted real easy. You really didn't notice it shifting. Well, it's got enough power. Absolutely. And I think that that's really the key to these transmissions. And, and one of the things when you step off into it, the way it downshifts, that to me is that tells a lot because the upshift, you really, it's so smooth, you really don't notice it. But when it starts downshifting, because sometimes it'll drop down two gears right. and you don't even see it. It just automatically goes all the way down. And, and this one had the 323 gearing, so it was really a nice fit for running out on the road and being able to tow some stuff. And, uh, and out on the highway, it's still got a truck-like ride. It's not... Well, you that car you, but you drove it without a load. Exactly. You weren't towing anything. You weren't hauling anything. Yeah, and, but it still which, got it. Which, in many cases, is what people do. They don't do a lot of towing and hauling. Trucks have become which is where the Ram comes in with its air suspension. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you get a nice stable feel, even though it's a truck feel. Whenever you're going down the road, you know you're confident in, in the way you're feeling with the road. So if you're comparing it with something, you're going to look at possibly the Ram 1500 that starts at around 34,000 for the crew cabs, and the Ford F-150 sets up around 35 to go off. The Nissan Titan starts out at 38, and the Toyota Tundra is up around 37, all in the crew cabs starting up from there. Now the base crew cab Silverado starts at $34,800. Our base test Silverado started at $41,200 with the RST package and optioned it up to five, uh, $51,890 $51, for the total drive out on the MSRP on this vehicle, which really and truly, if you equip the other brands, they're all within a few thousand dollars. And then you take dollars. the $12,000 right off the top with all of the incentives. Uh, <laughs> that's the way that it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, they, that, these days, absolutely. You have to they, look at all they, that. They price it up to mark it down. They're pretty much, yeah. That's it. All right. Thank you, sir. Hey, the In Wheel Time uh, Car Show streams on Facebook. It also streams on YouTube and the InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, iHeart Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Podcasts, Podcast Attic, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, we have the events calendar and more coming up next on the In Wheel Time Car Show right after this quick break. There's no greater pain a parent can suffer than losing a child. And yet heat stroke deaths in hot cars are on the rise. The temperature inside a vehicle can reach deadly levels in just a few minutes. Leaving windows cracked does not help. These preventable deaths can occur even when the outside temperature is as low as 57 degrees. Never leave your baby or child in a vehicle, even for a short period. And always check the back seat before you get out of the car. Where's baby? Look before you lock. Paid for by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Did you ever know anybody that played the xylophone in school? If I say anything, I'll... You did! <laughs> couldn't, even, couldn't even spell it. And you probably knew somebody that played the oboe too, didn't you? I married a woman who played the <laughs> who played the Jeff clarinet. Jeff played the oboe. <laughs> Andrew played the clarinet in the OU marching band. Well, hey, I, I will admit that I actually played the clarinet myself, uh, and 
I got out of that as quick as I could. As soon as I found out that there was a woodshop class available, <laughs> boom, I was into the woodshop class. That was the end of the clarinet. Thank you. Yeah, well, there, there's that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's uh, In Wheel Time Car Show. Time now for our events calendar. This is what's uh, going on this weekend. Is it this weekend? This weekend. And weekends to come? Yeah, weekends to come will be when we do calendar, which is next hour. Oh, okay. That, that's so a, all right. the good news is tonight is the on night for Nifty 50s. So up at Grogan's Mill Mall or up at Grogan's Mill Shopping Center, uh, Randy Shannon and the whole Nifty 50s crowd are going to be there. Always a great event to go to. Just some wonderful collection and of cars. And if Randy doesn't run my promo that I did two weeks ago, that he has yet to acknowledge that he had. Oh, I can't find it. So we're I sent it to him, him again. Well, yeah, we're going to go up there and bust his shop. Morning? No, I did not send it again this morning. So tonight um, is the Holdfast Performance Bikini Car Wash. Oh, hey, where's this? That's at the North... Uh, a little bit northwest on uh, 1960 and Jones Road behind the Auto Zone. So we could go there so uh, as I take you home. As you take me home, we can go to the bikini car wash. I'll wear my bikini, and if you wash me, we're all good to go. That's um, sick. <laughs> You know, there's something, something attractive about and that. Then, I'm not uh, exactly sure what it is. The, uh, the, uh, the Northside Mustang Car Club, Freddy's Monthly Cruise in uh, in Magnolia. <laughs> Tonight at 6 p.m. is the Kima Car Meet, and that's, that's kind of an every-night thing. So we've got Northwest. We've got Southside. Uh, at 7 p.m., the uh, Cars Across Texas Meet, and that's at uh, Spring uh, uh, at uh, Cypress and Luetta. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, yes. <laughs> He's still thinking. And then tomorrow morning I threw is, him off with my comment, is the, uh, at 8 a.m. the Mustangs of Houston Galveston Cruise. They're going to meet at the Bucky's and Katy, uh, depart at uh, 10 a.m., meet up again at the Bucky's in Texas City, and then head on. Uh, into, would it be okay if I took the Corvette? I'm sure they would be happily accept you. Is Tom. Randy going? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I haven't talked to him to find out. He was watching here a few minutes ago, so possibly. Randy, let us know. Jump online and tell us if you're going. Um, and then 7 p.m. tomorrow night is the Los Amigos Jeep uh, Club anniversary celebration, and that's going to be, in, I believe, in the Pearland area. And then Houston Motorsports Park is Test and Tune at 5 p.m. Uh, and then finally Sunday night at Freddy's at 1960 at Eldridge. They always have their, uh, uh, their, their meet as well. Is it a bunch of old guys with old cars? A bunch of cool cars and cool guys. For you? Well, they're, they're not all old guys. There's, there's, there's actually quite a few young guys. There's, there's a, actually a pretty big crowd of Mustangs will show up to that as well. Late it, models too? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. When you look at a lot of these meets around town, the Northside Mustang Club and the Mustang Club, the Mustang Club of Houston, they're very active in getting their, their uh, crew out to a lot of these meets. So there's always stuff well, to look at. That's what it's all about. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us, calling all car, truck, and Jeep clubs, as we mentioned. Uh, we love to feature your bunch in our car club spotlight. Uh, just shoot us an email to info at inwheeltime.com, please. Please also include your contact information, and we'll get your bunch on our show. In Wheel Time continues after this snappy break. Do you know what teens just love? Not being told what you're supposed to love. That's not anyone's business but yours. It doesn't matter what you love. But if you love it, click it. That includes you, too. Because in 2018, 42% of Texas teens who died in traffic crashes were not wearing their seatbelts. Make sure everyone is buckled up. Every rider, every ride. Brought to you by the Texas Department of Transportation. Texas Truck Works is your go-to truck customizer. From mild-to-wild lift kits, custom wheels and steering and handling enhancements, to the best personal and commercial wraps, Texas Truck Works delivers. Let Texas Truck Works founder Scott Stevens help you get the most out of your truck or Jeep. Texas Truck Works has decades of customizing experience, including power adders and complete engine swaps. Let the Texas Truck Works team design an upgrade plan that fits your budget. Get Truck Attitude today at TexasTruckWorks.com. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to America's award-winning car talk show, In Wheel Time, your weekly go-to all-things automotive place. Along with Mike out of this world, Mars, and King Conrad DeLong, I'm Don Armstrong. Glad you could join us 
on this Saturday. This is our uh, live edition broadcast, if you happen to be watching on our social media platforms, uh, that also goes into podcast form once Mars gets home and Chops get, them up into about half hour segments. Yeah, half hour segments. So um, if you m- miss any parts of the show, you can always pick it up in podcast form in 30 minute syn- synchronous individual. And they're, and they're topical as well. You know, each each segment has Well, we its would own like to think so. Topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and actually, I think the uh, last half hour of the. Uh, the segment with Todd was awesome. What a great! Uh, I'm, I'm going to go buy his book. As a matter of fact, yeah, it, uh, it, it, it's great stuff. I, I mean, I, I love the whole history thing, and especially that first gen Bronco. You know, with all the excitement that we've seen this week over the uh, introduction or reintroduction of the all new Bronco, that's actually going to be available at dealers in the spring of next year. They, if you're just now joining us and you don't really know what's going on with the Bronco, they debuted it on a digital platform, also on the Disney uh, platforms as well. Uh, Last Monday night, huge hit, and the buzz all this week has been about the new Bronco. And speaking of which, uh, we want to apologize to our EV people that may be tuning in because of a promo that we did, and we were going to talk about EVs. Uh, at least half of the show, and the other half was going to be on Broncos. Well, we had to drop the EVs because... So many of them. They've all gone out of business. Yeah. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them have gone out of business. I mean, this this whole COVID-19 thing has just really killed everybody. Damaged a lot of people, yeah. right? And so uh, those that were sitting on the edge of being in business and not in business, out of business. At least they've shut down their business. We started trying to get a hold of them uh, last week, as a matter of fact, and uh, we found out that we couldn't get a hold of anybody. Nobody would answer our emails. And then a little bit further depth into the research, we found out that they're... Close the doors. Close the doors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the EV thing is, it, to me, it, right now, is a tough business to begin with. And uh, because, as I've mentioned on this show, and especially with my reviews of EVs, the infrastructure really isn't there, in my opinion, to be able to afford a forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar EV and not be able to get it right. charged up, and and hundred thirty, hundred fifty thousand when you look at some of the high line Teslas, absolutely, and um, it, it, it's a major problem in my estimation, and the range anxiety that I had was horrible. Why would I put myself through that? I think that in the next few years, I think that it is going to actually take care of itself. Matter of fact, I read a press release this week that there is a company that is spending like a bajillion dollars in more infrastructure, more charging stations, fast charging stations. You know, you can go from actually almost no charge at all to a full charge within about 30, 40 minutes. And that's probably going to be somewhat regionally set up where the EVs are very popular right now. Because an EV in Central Texas isn't going to be a popular sale, but an EV in Metro New York, an EV in, in downtown Houston, California, San Francisco, LA, they sell a lot of they sell a lot of pure electric. So that's probably where that infrastructure is going to get set up first. Well, you know, in the and it, it, it makes sense because if you think about it, you know, particularly in LA, where you sit in traffic for an extended period of time. Well, you're using just a little bit of energy to keep the air conditioning right. uh, on. So you're sitting in traffic. Well, there's a big difference in sitting in traffic and going down the freeway it's at 80 miles, miles an hour. Now, right. right. A huge difference. And so it really sucks the energy out. So that's my... Well, I know General Motors has been talking about their new platform setup, their sca- what I call the skateboard of an EV. So it's wheels, tires, powertrain, battery pack, and then they can just plop any kind of body they want on it. And they're talking about they're going to be here shortly releasing a pickup truck that's going to have a 400-mile range. Now, that range is going to vary depending on how much of a truck you use because I imagine if you throw a lot of weight in it and you're going to try and do things, that's going to shorten its range. But a 400-mile range on a battery pack is substantial considering a lot of vehicles – 
A gas-powered vehicle, normally about 300 miles, is about what you're going to get on a tank full of fuel. But you can stop right at the intersection about <laughs> within a mile where there's a gas station on every corner well, and fill morning. it up. <laughs> yeah, and you can fill it up. Right. Whereas an EV, eh, the charging stations are not so uh, numerous out there on the open road. Yeah. So there is that. So, and, you know, we were talking about the Bronco uh, earlier, and uh, it made me think – which is a difficult thing for me to do <laughs> to begin with. It that's made, what we smelled. <laughs> that's what you smelled, uh-huh, brain burning, um, is the fact that the car manufacturers, even though that there is no EV or a hybrid form of the Bronco being announced at this time, it's strictly gasoline, oh. you know as well as I do that they have developed that new Bronco mm -hmm. platform to be able to accept batteries, and an electric motor. And, and, and a gas-electric hybrid, because when you look at that powertrain that they put in it, you know, and then look at uh, what they had in the Fusion, uh, what they have in some of their other vehicles, that's an easy transfer of that powertrain into the Bronco. Well, the other thing is, is that they're already getting really good gas mileage out of those turbocharged engines yeah. that Ford puts out to the begin with. Yeah, the four-cylinder, that's going to be the base engine in it, and the EcoBoost V6... That's going to have 300 horsepower in it. It's going Hello, to have the power of a V8. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you start gearing it down into an off-road vehicle. Well, all of the torque that it has will be used in a gear that's you know, <laughs> up 20 there. to one. 20, by the time yeah. you do the multiplication from a, yeah. a two to one transfer case and a 410 rear gear. Yeah. Um, so you know that all of these new vehicles, they're all. They've all been engineered to either go to a hybrid or to a pure electric somewhere in its future and not too distant future. I was going to say not too distant future because it's an easy transition. And then some of that transition is this dual mode hybrid uh, like, like Ram's using on the, what, what do they call it, the E-Boost? E-Torque. Uh, e E-Torque. E-Torque. You know, where it's not full electric, it's not full hybrid, but it's an, it's an electric boost to what you're doing to kind of help your fuel economy. And I don't think most people really understand that. It's a $1,500 option. And we, I think we figured if you did 30,000 miles uh, over a, a, you know, a couple of year period of time, that over three years you'd be recover. able to recover that $1,500. And, but that's the genius of eTorque is it, it helps you get started. It helps you get moving to reduce your fuel consumption. Yeah, it. yeah, exactly. Um, so that, that hybrid... Um, powertrain, the full electric powertrain, or the hybrid boost, um, all of those things are going to be very easy to transition onto all new cars, and I'm sure all manufacturers are, manufacturers are designing that into the platform itself. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is diesels, uh, and you say what you will about diesels, and I'm not a huge diesel fan, but diesels to me <clears throat> would really be, if you could keep the weight down, and you not go uh, super heavy duty on the weight category with a diesel. Diesel would be, seems to me, the perfect off-road engine to have. Oh, well, and that's why Jeep's putting it in the Wrangler. Right. You know, because you're talking about low-speed torque. That's what diesel does is, is it's about low-speed torque. And when you're doing off-roading, you don't want to have a lot of RPM in the engine because then you start getting losing grip and stuff gets a little weird. But that low-speed torque is where, uh, uh, where the diesel shines. And Ford has a small diesel that they sell in the, in the uh, transit van. I don't have one. Do they? Yeah, they have a small, they, have a small uh, they call it a power stroke diesel. There's no relation to the power stroke that they sell, the 67, 64, 60, 73. But it's a small inline, I believe it's an inline five-cylinder uh, engine. You know, I, I've never, I never understood a five-cylinder engine. I know that General Motors had one, and it was a total piece of... Well, Audi had That one. was in the Hummer <laughs> that had absolutely well, it was in the no H3. power. Nothing. It was in the H3. Oh. It was gutless. But uh, Audi was really, t to my knowledge, kind of the first one to come out with a lot of five-cylinders. And there was a whole generation of five-cylinder Audis. Okay, well, uh, I understand through a note-passing thing that you probably saw if you're watching us, uh, that Mr. Mars sent me a note and said that... Uh, you're cute. Will you take him to the prom? <laughs> he did say that. That was in the note. You looked over his shoulder, didn't you, cheater? I read it on the way by. <laughs> 
And the teacher's going to take it and give it to the principal. And both of you boys are going to go to uh, detention. Thank you very much. So okay. Seth Burgess is joining us now. He's the CEO of Gateway Bronco and the owner of the first Bronco ever built. Seth, great to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me today. You bet. So tell me about uh, Gateway. Uh, and uh, I, I understand that, that you guys uh, uh, actually have uh, some classic Broncos. You've got – you're a Bronco kind of guy. <laughs> yes, we are. So, uh, you know, in 2016, um, our 17-year-old daughter asked to go cross-country in a Bronco, and I took her up on it. And we went from uh, Walden Pond to Niagara to Glacier to Seattle and down Pacific Coast Highway in an original paint, unrestored uh, Ford Bronco with drum brakes. And so, Whoa, uh, that had to be a fun <laughs> ride on the PCH. It, you know, it was. It was good. We, uh, we ended up having uh, you know, only two hours of fuel as we went through big sky country. Uh, two <laughs> tanks and two hours of fuel is all we got. We pulled a 1965 tent camper. That was our um, that was our first real experience with the Bronco, and and just have been in love ever since. And so, uh, you know, we um, as we went through time, you mentioned the first Bronco. We were offered uh, from the second owner an opportunity to buy the uh, the prototype Bronco. The Bronco was owned by Carroll Shelby for ten years, uh, gifted from Ford to uh, uh, to Carroll, and the first V8. And those classic pictures of Donald Fry uh, debuting the Bronco uh, have been proven over time to be that first prototype. Well, I'll say, and I assume that you've got, is that the blue one that I see in a picture that uh, you sent us? It, it is, yes. And, uh, we, you know, we're just so excited because it runs and drives, three on the tree, you know, the first sport model, first V8. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the cool thing about it is Ford, uh, use the Carroll Shelby trick of repainting that vehicle multiple times and then having it reconfigured from the Roadster to the full wagon to the half cab and then taking plenty of, plentiful amount of pictures and video to be able to do the uh, well, I'm, advertising. I'm going to give real props to your daughter because if she knows how to drive a three-speed on the tree, <laughs> she knows something that a lot of kids don't. <laughs> I can't say that our daughter does, but our, our, our 18 year old son certainly does. And he's driven that. And that was one of the earliest vehicles he's ever driven. So I thought that was pretty special. So Seth, tell me a little bit about uh, gateway Broncos and uh, what you do. Sure. We, um, you know, we essentially take the first generation Bronco. We make it reliable. We make it fun. Uh, we make it something that you can drive on a daily basis. We warranty it uh, throughout North America and Europe. And, and we, we essentially put a Mustang GT powertrain in the Bronco. Uh, we upgrade the suspension so you can drive it on the canyon roads or you can drive it down the interstate with two fingers on the wheel. So um, reimagining the, the original Bronco with maintaining the, the essence of the original character. I mean, I really think hard about what did, Do what did Donald Fry and Lee Iacocca really want in that original machine. And if they had built it today, what would they do with modern technology? And, and that's that's essentially what we do. We do it on an assembly line the way Henry Ford envisioned. And um, we produce a lot of this first generation Bronco with a coyote engine and 10 speed automatic. So I coyote I, engine. So I assume <laughs> that th this has a completely custom built frame underneath it. Uh, not always. We have, um, you, you know, as many people know, we're licensed from Ford Motor Company and we're able to provide you with an original Bronco frame and uh, a completely reimagined vehicle with modern technology, but maintaining that original frame and that original kind of suspension architecture. And then, um, you know, there's another licensee that, that builds the frame, and that's uh, Thomas Kenzer. Many people know uh, Kenzer Engineering, and, and he has just a magnificent four-link uh, suspension that we would use for a new frame application and that's uh, that's also available under our Ford licenses to build you a brand new vehicle in 2020 um, that is a reproduction uh, of the original, except upgraded with a modern chassis and, uh, and and brand new body. Well, unfortunately, we don't have your video today, so we're only listening to you in audio form. But uh, where can people, our our viewers and followers, go? 
to see what you do, how much it costs, uh, what's involved in it, uh, not only restoring the classics, I don't know how you keep a frame of a classic first-gen Bronco from not twisting itself in two with a great big coyote <laughs> engine no. in it, but uh, I, I guess that's a secret that you'll have to explain somebody uh, to somebody uh, later on. But at any rate, uh, so tell me more about how you get into your world of Broncos. Sure. Well, we have a we have a way you can build your own Bronco on our website, and it's gatewaybronco.com. So that's gatewaybronco.com. And we have three models to choose from. You choose a model, and you can select every option that you'd like. And at the end of the process, get a build sheet uh, and know exactly what you'd be getting, from Porsche leather to uh, American Bison leather, which is one of my favorites. Um, you can get the 2.3-liter EcoBoost in the Bronco, or you can get an EV Bronco, which you were just speaking of. And we, we have a, uh, a fantastic uh, EV system to get you over 240 miles of uh, range. Where, so, are you, where are you located, um, Seth? We are located in the Midwest in uh, St. Louis Market right off of Route 66. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I, I guess that you go to uh, the drag strip. Hence the gateway. Yes, the gateway, the, the, <laughs> the, the drag strip. Well, you know, uh, ironically, I, I race a, uh, a vintage Shelby uh, Mustang, a 67 Shelby Mustang, on the road course at Gateway. Of so course we you do. Last Tuesday. <laughs> well, listen, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and I, I have to ask you before we let you go, what do you think about that new Bronco? Uh, we love it. We've got over 100 on allocation that we personally uh, um, uh, put on reserve. So they were the ones who were jamming up the system as he was botting the uh, $100. Todd, that's why Todd couldn't get one. <laughs> Have you uh, read Todd Todd's can, book? Uh, <laughs> Todd can give us a call. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of yeah. it. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. Well, we're all excited about the Bronco. Uh, I, I know that, that uh, the media has exploded in the past week since its debut on Monday night, and uh, we had to ask you. And, you know, I have a feeling that it'll probably enhance your business. Most people might think, oh, well, his business is dead. I mean, no, I think it's going to enhance it because I think that with all this attention that it's now brought to the Bronco brand, that people are going to go, hey, I really like the new Bronco, but how cool would it be to have a retro, a real retro one? And elevate all of them yeah oh absolutely i think it's been proven over and over again when the new challenger came out it improved the previous the vintage when the you know when the new hemi came out the previous hemi you know the vintage hemi was more valuable same thing with the mustang gt uh and the shelby side the vintage shelby same thing with the uh with the ford gt uh and the gt40 they all raise in value on the vintage side and so I think we're going to see the same thing here. And our clients want both. They want to have a vintage and they want to have a new vehicle. So we're, we're doubling our volume. Gatewaybronco.com. Seth, it's great to talk to you. I posted a Thank link you. on our Facebook page. Fantastic. Have a great day. You do the same. Thanks again. That's pretty cool. I know, isn't it though? Yeah, very it, much. Give so. me a Gen One Bronco with a Coyote well, engine it, it, in it's it. It's like a resto and mod, a and 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 then take delivery of your brand new and have him have his and hers ooh, in the ooh. garage. Drive your new one up there to pick it up to his place, and then bring them both home. I love it. Great <laughs> idea. I'll ride with you. <laughs> All right, uh, time now for Ram Tracks. It will times we can look into the Ram Nation, Mr. Mars. So a lot of people, when you buy a truck, one of the big things people look at is towing, what you can tow and what you can haul with it and everything. So trying to figure out a lot of times if you're kind of new at that or, or even if you're just very specific about what you do, you may be wondering what some things weigh or how much you can do. If you go to ramtrucks.com and go up underneath, they've got a, a section there called Towing Capabilities, and under that you're going to find something that says Towing Info. And you're going to find that there is a, a chart there that gives you some very specifics about some items to give you an idea of what it is. If you're looking to tow your boat trailer, I mean, that can be 300 to 1,500 pounds. Uh, a box trailer can be, depending on size, 507 pounds. A car trailer, if you're hauling cars or, or you want to take your car to the drag strip, 2,800 pounds for the, for the trailer itself, and then figure in your car on top of that that you're going to be pulling with it. So there's a lot of things in there, and it goes on down through cars and RVs, construction equipment, even building material like plywood. I didn't realize plywood weighs three pounds per square foot per inch of thickness. So, so you know, you can figure out how many sheets of plywood weight-wise you can carry in this vehicle. 
And, and it goes on down through a lot of other things, upfits and some other things. And it also has a chart about some things that you might hear, some, some terms you may hear like GCVW, gross combined vehicle weight. And it gives you some definitions so that you, when you go to buy or you go to look at your truck, you can get a little bit better idea understanding what you're talking about and looking for. Thank you, sir. Coming up next here on In Wheel Time, Conrad's Car Clinic. Uh-oh, Brad's buzzed. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's starting with the woots. <laughs> <laughs> and now a speech. I just want to say that friendship is about heart. Heart and brain. Who's with me? Good thing is, he knows when he's buzzed. And my brain is saying, when it's time to go home, somebody call me a ride. Love that guy. Me too. Know your buzzed warning signs? Call for a ride when it's time to go home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. <laughs> A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're on the In Wheel Time Car Show. Thanks for riding with us today. Time for Conrad's Car Clinic. And we were talking earlier, actually, right before we got on uh, the air uh, this morning, and that is the fact that, you know, part of the fluid change thing that I need to do in the Corvette, Corvette's 20 years old, and I don't, it's only got 24,000 miles on it, and one of the things that I know I need to do is change all of the fluids in it. Because they're old. Well, I can relate to that. <laughs> and a little wore out. Yeah. And probably a little contaminated. You know, and people have heard me say this before. All fluids, all lubricants uh, in your vehicle basically do three things. They do a lot more than that. But if we look at it as three things, they cool, they lubricate, and they clean. And in cleaning, it isn't that they go in and physically scrub clean, but they deliver contaminants to a filter. Well, the power steering system really doesn't have a filter in it. Some of them may have a bit of a screen, but there is no physical filter. Now, when you get on some of the big trucks and stuff, they may have a filter on it. And power steering fluid tends to be a bit of a forgotten fluid as well. And with that... If you're not looking at your power steering fluid on a regular interval, uh, the opportunity for an expensive repair to come behind uh, is, is quite high. You know, putting a uh, power steering rack in or power steering pump can cost well north of $1,500, $2,000. What? Oh, easily, easily. You know, rack, you're going you're gonna to spend 1200 bucks just on the rack, and then, you know, you think it, some of them are relatively complicated to get off. Some are real simple to get off. But uh, spending fifteen hundred, two thousand bucks might not be uh, unusual. Well, thanks a lot for that on vote the, of on confidence the new, yeah, on the newer vehicles. So you got to look at what's happening to the fluid. Now, in today's vehicles, probably about half of them actually use an electronic power steering system right now. So whether it's an electronic motor or they use a series of magnets to assist the steering. Older style vehicles use a hydraulic pump, and that pump is driven by uh, the belt on the front of the engine. And that pump is generally mounted right in front of an exhaust manifold, so the fluid gets hot quick. And you're talking about fluids that are probably in the 250 to 300 degree range would not be unusual. So that fluid degrades over time just by the heat, and it oxidizes, and it changes color. Talking about color in power steering systems, there could be one of three colors of fluid that's out there. Uh, there's an amber color. There's a red color. Now, amber and red basically are the same fluid, just with a dye in it. And then there's a green color, and the green is, is a full synthetic fluid. Um, you know, we sell one at BG. There's another brand out there called Pintosin, and it's generally used in the Highline Imports. Any relationship to Mr. Coctosin? I have no idea, and I'm not going to go there because it came from you, so I'm going <laughs> to avoid the, avoid the error of uh, following that up with a question. So, again, those fluids need to be changed regularly. The things that you want to look for, because one of the things about power steering I said is there's no filter in there. So if you get the system running, turn it off, pull the dipstick out, and get a little bit on your finger and rub it on your finger and see whether or not there you can feel a little bit of abrasiveness inside of the fluid. And that abrasiveness is caused by the 
uh, <laughs> hoses beginning to deteriorate on the inside. You know, every time you roll the steering wheel all the way to one end and it goes, bzzz, you know, that is the, the swelling and contracting of the hoses. So over time, those hoses will deteriorate and put that abrasive inside of there. That's why you want to get it out. Get your power steering fluid checked. Get it replaced on a regular interval. It's not that expensive to do, and it'll save you a ton of money in the Mr. long run. Mr. Cogtosen happened to have been one of characters of uh, Chevy Chase in the movie Fletch. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, dude, you may want to slow down. There's a cop car up there. Hey, man, there's another cop. I'd think about putting your seatbelt on if I were you. <sighs> and if you could sober up in less than five seconds, that'd be cool, too. As America gets back on the road, a lot of things have changed, but not the need for drivers to be safe. Cops are enforcing traffic safety laws in our community to save lives. Paid for by NHTSA. If you had, if you had any idea how many buttons and slide faders and stuff I've got to try to change and move and and push on and push off and that sort of thing. You'd be amazed at what I can doing over here. Well, that's only because you want to shut us up, so you're the only <laughs> one talking. And you know what? You know what? I can do that. <laughs> time now for this hour's headlines here on the Goodwheel Time program. Uh, Subaru ranked highest among mass market brands, and Lexus topped the luxury brands in the 2020 J.D. Power U.S. Automotive Brand Loyalty Study. That was released this past Wednesday. Subaru also ranked highest overall. Rounding out the top five were Honda at 58.7%, Ram at 57.3%, and Ford at 54.3%. Brand loyalty is increasing among new vehicle owners, a study found. Uh, Tyson Jomini, vice president of data and analytics at J.D. Power, who we've talked to before, mm -hmm. said automakers have ramped up efforts to maintain customer loyalty during the coronavirus pandemic. No surprise there. Did you hear that FCA had three models that made the Auto Traders summer car uh, top ten list? I Jeep, did. Jeep Wrangler, Ram 1500, the Jeep Grand Cherokee were all uh, – Top cars on the Auto Trader's summer top 10 list. Well, speaking of FCA branded vehicles, uh, the merged unit of Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and PSA Group will be known as Stellantis, the two automakers announced on Wednesday. The automaker said the name will be used exclusively at the group level as a corporate brand and that the names and logos of the group's constituent brands will remain unchanged, meaning... The Good, because I can't spell Stellantis. <laughs> Stellantis. The company said the name is rooted in the Latin verb stello. I wonder if it has Stella! Anything, no, or that's either that or stiletto, uh, which means to brighten with stars. And your, ma and your matching shoes. The company said the next step will be the unveiling of a logo. The group will create the world's fourth largest automaker. PSA's considerable footprint in Europe could complement... FCA strength here in North America. The completion of the merger is expected in the first quarter of 2021. And moving on to Jeep, Fiat Chrysler's free-spirited brand ahead of Monday's debut of the all-new Bronco variants threw down the gauntlet in the off-road wilderness with the V8-powered Wrangler Rubicon 392 oh concept. Oh, my gosh. Hold on tight. The concept released early Monday. Before the Bronco debut, tops out. Remember when we had Jim Morrison on here two weeks ago? He said yeah. he, had, he had something up his sleeve. Well, here it came out He's of got the sleeve. something under his hood. <laughs> <laughs> the concept released early Monday tops out at 450 horsepower and 450 pound-feet of torque and boasts a zero to 60 time of less than five seconds. And don't you know Morrison has just got a big smile on his face? In a Wrangler. <laughs> they, got a, they got a turbo four-cylinder and a turbo V6. Oh, I got a Hemi. Oh, my God. So... Uh, the Wrangler's predecessor, the CJ, was the last to have a V8 in 1981. That model, Fiat Chrysler Automobile said, delivered 125 horsepower and 220 <laughs> pound-feet of torque. The concept sounds production ready. It's equipped with Dana 44 axles, full-time two-speed transfer case, electric front and rear axle lockers, 37-inch mud terrain tires, and a Jeep Performance Parts 2-inch lift kit from Mopar, along with suspension enhancements and a more robust Eight-speed uh, automatic transmission. The interior, exterior features a heavy-duty raised performance hood and an aggressive appearance. The interior is highlighted by red leather seats and a performance 
steering wheel. And you can't wait to get one to drive. Oh, my God. Yeah, and you know that we will. Oh, yeah. yeah. It might not be right out of the box, but it's going to be pretty close to it. I, I, I am thrilled, to say the least. Oh, yeah. And can't wait. Because you know we're going to get one. I'm and hoping. Mars wants to do the off-road acceleration ramp. <laughs> Doesn't have to be the on the on ramp. Oh, really? The off road accelerator. He'd take it out to the take it out to the beach and go blazing down the beach. The beach is empty right now, isn't it? It's, yeah. Well, it, 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 it's supposed to be. Yeah, count on that. <clears throat> yeah. So that's it for this hour, uh, hour number two of our show. After a quick break, this is in wheel time, and we are all things automotive. Is your business or company looking to stand out in a crowded advertising market? Looking to reach the real auto enthusiast? Well, you found it. You're listening or watching In Wheel Time, and so are your fellow enthusiasts. The In Wheel Time car show now reaches half a million, and we can put together a marketing plan that will engage them in your product, business, or service. To get the tires rolling, just shoot us an email to our marketing director, Jeff Zekin. His address is jeff at inwheeltime.com. If baby could talk, she'd say a lot. You'd know what she's thinking and what makes her happy. But unfortunately, baby can't talk. Or remind you, you're the one taking her to daycare today. And she won't speak up if you drive straight to work like any other day and never think to look in the backseat. Every year, dozens of kids die from heat stroke in cars. No one is perfect. So set a reminder and always look before you lock. Where's baby? Paid for by NHTSA. From Studio A in Texas, it's hour number two of the All Things Automotive Car Talk Show in Wheel Time. Just ahead, all about the new Ford Bronco. We talked to the brand manager about the reimagined new darling from Ford. Ram Rebel Diesel is in the new car showroom this hour. We take you for a ride. Later this hour, go inside the mystery garage. And we have our Jeep Trails feature. Plus, the stories making automotive news headlines this week, all just ahead on the July 18th edition of the In Wheel Time Car Show. Along with Mike out of this world, Mars. Howdy, and King Mom. Conrad DeLong. I'm Don Armstrong. Glad that you could join us. And thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Is Esteban ready? Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. He is the Ford Bronco brand manager. Yeehaw. And his name is Esteban Plaza Jennings. Esteban, it's good to talk to you, and thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Good to talk to you guys. Well, uh, you haven't been busy or nothing, have you? <laughs> no, it's been a quiet week. Uh, yeah, I'll, I, I can, I can, I can only imagine. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, last week at this time he was clean shaven. He has not had a chance to shave, and so uh, that's that's what we're seeing today. Well, it's great to talk to you, and I know that you guys have got to be thrilled with uh, all of the talk and all of the 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 absolute bar none, probably the hottest vehicle in the last decade that has been brought forth by any uh, auto manufacturer, and that would be Ford and the new Bronco. So what do you got to say, man? I mean, I, I look at all of the, the, the talk on media that is all across the United States, and you got to be thrilled. We're, we're very excited. Um, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of interest on Bronco. We've sold out our first edition for Bronco. Uh, we were the number one trending video on YouTube the night of reveal, number one trending hashtag on Twitter. So, you know, from a excitement perspective, we're glad we were able to deliver and give customers what they've been asking for for so long. So what is it that, uh, what kind of feedback are you getting? Uh, obviously, I can't even imagine anybody saying anything negative about it. I mean, the retro look is a smash hit. There's no doubt about it. I mean, let, let's just use Mustang as an example. How dare anybody touch the look of the Mustang forever and ever and ever? I think that the worst thing that ever happened was the Mustang II. Uh, that, that, was pro <laughs> that was a mistake that you guys quickly remedied. And I would imagine that uh, with this retro thing that, that you guys got going on with the Bronco, um, it's nothing but kudos to you. Yeah, we... We internally kind of debated, right? There's so much heritage behind Bronco. How do you go about bringing back the icon? And as we talked about the vehicle we wanted to bring to market and where the excitement has been in the collector space, I think a lot of that has been around the first generation Bronco. You know, that's been the hottest collector's car in the last couple of years. And 
So when we were when we were going through how we were going to design the new Bronco, we really spent a lot of time looking at the first generation design and using that as inspiration to bring back this new Bronco. And we and, actually, uh, go ahead. And with the first gen Bronco, it had a huge motorsports presence. Um, I don't know if you can tell us anything. Is there a motorsports presence planned for the current gen? Yeah, we've actually, uh, we've introduced the Bronco R. We introduced that um, at SEMA of last year. And that vehicle actually ran in Baja. And so that was trying to pay homage to, you know, Bronco being the first and only four-wheel drive vehicle to win overall the Baja 1000. Um, so, you know, we that's the way we introduced the world to Bronco was through motorsport. Right. Um, and there were a lot of design hints in that race vehicle um, that kind of hinted at what we what we showed off on Monday. Well, clearly the competition is really stiff. I mean, uh, let's face it. I mean, uh, the Jeep has a long and storied history uh, across the United States and across the globe, for that matter. And it's clear by, by some of the things that we have seen uh, through the press release and Monday night's debut that you're clearly uh, going right for the jugular when it comes to Jeep Wrangler. Yeah, I think... We are paying homage to the original Bronco, right? The, the really neat part of the story about Bronco is that it was introduced at the same time as Mustang. And they were always supposed to be sort of siblings in the stable, these two horses. Actually, the, the designer who designed the Mustang emblem also is the same designer who designed the Bronco emblem. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a pretty neat fact. And so, you know, as we bring the new Bronco back, we're, we're living in that same space. Bronco was always about being the off-road sports car for Ford. And that's how we were, we're trying to position this new Bronco. It's not about, you know, just being a, a single purpose rock crawling vehicle. This vehicle, because of our suspension architecture, because of the Haas independent front suspension, um, we're, we're making a vehicle that can excel both in high speed terrain and also in, in the technical stuff as well. What are the two most uh, exciting things that uh, you got that that you actually think uh, the Bronco, the new Bronco, brings to the market? And what are the two most exciting things that you have seen that the media has really focused in on? I think uh, the two things I'm most excited about first off is 35 inch tires from the factory. Yeah, that is, uh, a segment first. Um, and we will have the largest tires in segment. Um, and not only do we have offer those tires, but we're going to offer them not just on our uh, high spec, hardcore off road trim, but we're going to offer them on the base series as well. Okay, right? as an option, that is really so, cool. Yes. Yeah, you're going to be able to check the box and get 35s with the Sasquatch package. <laughs> Sasquatch package, I love that. Yes, exactly. That's right, yeah. And, and it's the got number... all sorts of good stuff in it. It's got uh, locking front and rear diffs. It's got beadlock ready wheels. It's got those 35s. It's got our uh, automatic four by, advanced 4x4 four four transfer case. So we're really excited to be able to offer it to, at all price points. So what, do you, what, what is the biggest buzz with the media? Besides the tires, obviously that's, that's a huge plus. I think uh, the media is, uh, I mean, there was a lot of speculation about how we were going to bring Bronco back, right? Was it going to be a, a true hardcore off-road vehicle that is hyper capable? And are you going to be able to take the doors and roof off? Um, and I think just generally, I think the media is very excited that we were able to deliver on that premise of this being a legit four by four vehicle. Oh, I totally agree, and and it's not like Ford didn't generate this buzz for a number of years about where Bronco was and where it was going, and not that you were giving everything away about it, but little bits and pieces for almost three years now. So you guys really built a good buzz about it, and then the re the uh, reveal Monday was just awesome. So what yeah. kind of production numbers are you looking for on this? Yeah, we're not ready to discuss production numbers right now, um, but needless to say, we're excited to build um, a bunch of Broncos and satisfy customer man. <laughs> how, how many $100 orders did you get Monday night? Again, yeah, we're not unfortunately ready to disclose <laughs> our reservation numbers, but... Uh, Lots of them. <laughs> 
we sold out the first editions very quickly. So congratulations. Very yeah. Where is the where is the Bronco going to be built? The Bronco will be built in Wayne, Michigan, uh-huh. at Michigan Assembly Pan, alongside the Ford Ranger. Got you. Because from what I understand, that uh, the underpinnings of the Bronco, many components of it are the Ford Ranger components as well. Yeah, so it's based on the same chassis, the global midsize truck platform, the T6. Um, but there are a, a lot of unique components for Bronco, right? We're, we have a completely unique suspen- rear suspension on Bronco. We have a five link coilover suspension versus a leaf spring. So, uh, and the front suspension has also been optimized for Bronco and to clear those big tires. So, well, yeah, and why not use a little bit of parts bin where you've got proven parts coming out of the parts bin so that, you know, your development on the rest of the Bronco can be a little bit more focused. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so what are we, what, what's next? I mean, can we already select colors and options or packages? Uh, I know that uh, I heard, anyway, that uh, immediately once it was debuted, you start taking orders for it, and that your Ford dealer, whoever you ordered it through, would let you know when it was time to be able to drill down into the actual order boxes. Yep. So right now you can go place a reservation on Ford.com for $100, like you guys mentioned, and and get a spot in line. Um, You are selecting the series that you would like, and then um, the uh, whether you want a two-door or a four-door. Configure the door configuration. You know, one of the things that I I think it's important for us to mention is is that you debuted three vehicles, two of which are, are based on the Ranger platform, while the other one is uh, an actual crossover, and that's called the Bronco Sport. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, so I'm just going to disclaimer that I'm not the Bronco Sport brand manager. Okay. Rena Young is that uh, individual, and All I'm right. sure I'd love to get her on the show as well. But I will do my best to uh, impersonate her. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bronco Sport, yeah, it's a it's a very capable uh, crossover utility, like you guys mentioned. We like to say it is the Bronco of of crossovers. So um, it's targeted at a different customer than Bronco. This customer, um, they love getting outside, they love enjoying nature, but they're just using the car to get to their end activity, right? So they're hauling their mountain bikes to the trailhead. They're getting to the you know, the trail had to go backpacking or whatever the activity might be that they're participating in. Well, I thought it was a very interesting and I thought it was a brilliant marketing move that you also offer a Bronco on a little less capable platform and probably more affordable as well. It's really a different vehicle using the Bronco name but with Bronco, Bronco Sport, Sport to attached to it. Separated from the pure yeah. Bronco. Yeah. And when will that uh, when will that debut? So that vehicle actually comes first. Okay. So those vehicles will be arriving at dealerships at the end of this year. Okay. Very Not nice. Not that far away. Yeah, very nice. Right? You can actually go place the order right now with your dealer. So can we assume that with the Sasquatch package, uh, he may be making a an appearance in the commercials? <laughs> you have to look really hard to see him, I'm going to have to guess. <laughs> and that's why you grew the beard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, it, it's it, for the part. Yeah. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I know that you're a busy guy, especially at this point in, in the debut of the Ford Bronco, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Very much Let's so. stay in touch. And um, so the actual arrival at the dealership is slated for the spring of 2021. Correct. That, that's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, so no specific date, just spring wow. of 2021. Correct. Everything's fluid in automo- automotive manufacturing. So to speak. Well, Esteban, thanks again. We appreciate it. You take care of yourself, and congratulations again. Tell everybody at Ford we said hello. Will do. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, so okay. Esteban Plaza Jennings uh, is his name, and he is the Ford Bronco brand manager the in wheel time car show streams live on facebook.com slash in wheel time on youtube and on our website in wheel time.com podcasts available on apple podcast spotify stitcher radio iheart podcast google podcast and podcast addict quick break now then a look into the new ram rebel diesel back in a flash 
Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stone? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit? It's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is, your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high, get a DUI. Paid for by NHTSA. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You know, I'm thinking what we really need to do is that we need to start stop playing PSAs and just take a break and just, you know, really not uh, really not get involved in any kind of car conversation. Just talk about what we what these comments that you make or the comments that I make. No, those probably wouldn't go over well. This well, a, this is a commercial venture and we might lose a little bit of uh, well, we actually may gain some audience. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we should always sell a subscription to the commercial part of the show where you can hear Or, or hear the outtake comments. version that you can only get on our X-rated platform. Our conversations. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Kind of wander off the reservation quite a bit. Well, this is Houston's most in-depth car show in real time, streaming live online on Facebook, YouTube, and, and realtime.com. Time now for this hour's car review, and actually it's a truck, the 2020 Ram 1500. Uh, available trim le levels out the wazoo. Uh, pick one. Uh, you name it, they've got them. Uh, we're going to review today the Rebel Crew Cab 4x4 diesel. This is considered a standard pickup truck, or what we refer to as a half-tonner. How many passengers? Mine was capable of carrying six. Oh, so you, um, have the full, you have the front bench. bench seat in the front. I love that bench seat. And here's the deal with the bench it seat. It's probably cloth, too, right? No. No, it was leather. Okay. Here's the deal with the bench seat. So it's got the same width of the typical console, and it has kind of a console built into this. It's got the cup holders and some other little things that are in there. Well, there you can see it right there. That actually is the uh, standard one that has the console in it. So right. this, did, this, this didn't have the standard console like that one that you see there. But the, the whole console lifts up and is the back, okay? So if you've got any you know, trinkets inside the little door storage compartment, then they're all going to fall down yeah. to the bottom. But it's got little things in there that you can keep them all. It is the coolest thing. And the middle seat got its own seat belt. Just like a typical. So you can go on a real date like you used to with <laughs> Becky uh, and, uh, and and enjoy yourself. Or more likely, my 06 <laughs> had that, and we would fold it up whenever we had all the grandkids with us because we needed that extra seat. Otherwise, Sh sure, it was there. Sure, Mike. Sure, Mike. That's what you did. Such a liar. <laughs> anyway, exterior features. Rugged, rugged uh, blacked out grill and bumpers, and it's uh, really, uh, that's what the Rebel is all about, that rugged look. Uh, contrasting faux front skid plate with tow hooks, vented hood, different, more sinister headlights uh, than the chrome trim levels. I liked about the rugged look. I mean, it looks off-roady. Interior highlights. Uh, the 12-inch infotainment screen is what I had. Uh, Contrasting colored surfaces, red on black, that was really cool. Rebel monikers throughout the cabin and the seats. Uh, it had uh, dual glove boxes, tons of storage, some hidden compartments too, especially under the uh, back seat floor. Store extras, yeah, big storage yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cargo and trunk room, well, truck bed. Uh, ours had the optional folding tonneau cover on it, along with the movable gate that you could actually oh, like extend that. the yeah, bed. That's yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It has, of course, all the tie-downs, and this one had the Ram boxes on it. Three-liter V6 turbo diesel. Turns out 260 horsepower, but more importantly, 480 pound-feet of torque through an eight-speed automatic transmission. Tow rating up to 12,750 pounds. You can haul your 
house back there. Hall rating, 2,300 pounds. Uh, 21 city, 29 highway for a combined of 24. I got 23.3 over 250 miles. What I liked about it, that diesel grunt. You know, you got to be careful because you can burn those rear oh, yeah, tires. Yeah. Again, with, it's especially all about without, torque. Yeah, without without a load back there. What could use improvement? Um, when the engine is cold, it does have a little turbo lag to it. As I would imagine most diesels usually yeah. do when they're cold. That's why you'll go into a truck stop sometimes and you'll see all the diesels out there and they're all idling. Don't let them get cold. No, no, no. And no, they're no. not using any fuel. So. Not at idle. Yeah. Uh, ride and handling, smooth, baby. Uh, what could use improvement? Get it with the air suspension. There you go. That, That's that, the way. That is the key. That air suspension, oh, my God. I can't even tell you how good that thing is. Base price on this, forty-seven nine ninety. Price is tested. $70,880. And they'll sell all they make. And they That's, do. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it is low. Look look at the options on this thing. Well, probably if you want to show people, point it towards the camera, <laughs> not me. Oh, yeah. Well, there. I mean, it's all, it's got every option known to man on there. Base model price on the Ram is $32,145. Base model prices on the Ford F-150, $28,745. Uh, Chevy Silverado 28.3, Toyota Tundra 33.575, so about 30 grand. One of the neat things about this, though, um, that Ram offers in the Rebel, which I consider an up level half ton truck, is that full bench. Most of the other manufacturers, to get a full flat bench in them, you got to buy the stripper, you got to buy yeah, the, the work, work model. Truck. You're not going to be able to get it in an up level vehicle. Nope. So and you're still the, the the nice thing about the seat is is that it it it's not like it used to be. Let me put it that way. Back in the old days, first of all, you didn't have a fold down what you would call an armrest. Uh, it was one seat console. back and one seat cushion from side to side. Yeah, it was nothing. <laughs> so and you get into this vehicle and it is made. It's got the driver, the passenger, and then it's got the center section. So there's actually three separate seats all in one, but you can't tell when you got that center armrest down. No, huh? You want to call it that. I, it's more of a center console thing, thingy. Well, but it's the seat back folding down, right? right. Correct. Yeah, the seat and back. It's got a nice. It, it's vinyl. And it's and it's flat. You would never know. Yeah, it's great for writing. If you're writing on something and you need to write down notes or something. Because it's big enough to hold a full sheet of paper. Well, and and, it, and it's flat. Yes, it is flat. It it, 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 it they well listen, thought out. Very well, Very thought, well out. thought out. It's not the old trucks of your. Of that your. Would, uh, Mine? Your. That would be Y-O-R, your. Y -O -R, yeah, your. I was going to say your. <laughs> yeah. Y'all. Y'all. All right. So um, I've got to, uh, I, I was so busy doing that, I had to uh, kind of not be able to do uh, this work over here on the computer. Because so, you have all those buttons over there. Well, I, yeah, I am kind of multitasking, if you will. But now I'm ready, and I, we don't have to multitask anymore. You're special. <clears throat> the in-wheel time show continues. We're going to have the car calendar and the race card coming up next. 911, what's your emergency? God, there's a train that just hit a car. Sir, what is your location? Uh, 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 Look around for a street sign, it's sir. 8th and Orchard. 8th and Orchard. Okay, very good. 8th and Orchard. Sir, help is on the way. Why would he do that? What? The train still doesn't stop. You have to get there now. At a railway crossing, even if the engineer sees you and hits the brakes, it can take a mile for the train to stop. And for you, that's too late. Stop. Trains can't. Paid for by NHTSA. What does it remind you of? What does this remind you of? Huh? It reminds you of nothing. Uh, there's something. I'm trying to figure out what it is. Uh-huh. Let that mind work. Listen to that song. Hey, it's uh, the In Wheel Time Car Show. Thanks for joining us today. Um, it's time now for our car calendar and the race card. And Conrad always manages to put this together yeah, for us. Yeah, um, next weekend on July 25th at uh, 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the Tice Motorsports uh, Twilight Show. And that's at uh, 9606 Kirkton Drive, which is just south of 290 off of uh, Huffmeister. 
and then also next Saturday uh, at 4 p.m. is the Galveston Cherry Hill Cru- Cherry Hill Cruise. Boy, that's hard to say all quickly. Cherry Hill. And they're going to meet at the Bucky's and Katie at 4 p.m. Park. Oh, gosh. They're going to meet at the Katie's, <laughs> the Bucky's and Katie at 4 p.m. So get your get your uh, Bucky's fill. Get your act together and get out yeah. to Bucky's. Uh, and they're going to roll out at 5 p.m. They're going to stop at the Bucky's in Texas City because if you drank the big drink in Katie, you're going to have to get rid of it by the time you get to Texas City. <laughs> by the way, speaking the Bucky's of Bucky's, has the best bathrooms you'll ever stop. At. I want you to know, That's what they we, say. you know, uh, several years ago, when Bucky's was opening a store every other weekend, I was we tried very hard to get a hold of Bucky, and he nor his marketing person would not talk to us. They are the hardest people to get a hold of. So uh, if anybody out there knows them, have them contact us at down info. In a- they're in down Eng- in Angleton. You know. Yeah, I know. That's where, they, that's where they're based out of. Yeah. Well, and the, the original store is down there, too. Have you ever seen the original store? Uh, probably. Isn't that the one right off of 288 yeah, on but the it's, way to West Columbia? It's, it's, it's tiny. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just had no, to. You're not. <laughs> no, um, really not. Also, <laughs> next, next Sunday on the 26th is the HPD uh, – Twin, me- Twin Peaks meet at the Woodlands, and that's from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if you want to see some cool cool cars, go to that. Uh, Troy gets a pretty uh, good uh, They're high-performance cars, of, of right. mostly. Modern muscle, modern yeah. high-performance cars, right. Lamborghinis, Porsches, and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, Also on the 26th is the 8th uh, Annual Lone Star uh, Hot Rod and Music Festival at the Showboat Pavilion. The Showboat? The Showboat. Where's the Showboat? It, at the pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Um, and then uh, uh, October 25th, Northside Mustang Club is going to have their open car show in Con- at the Conroe Outlets. Racing, you know, uh, there's always the local stuff going on at uh, Houston Raceway Park. That's Friday nights at 6 p.m. Uh, Friday night uh, at 6.30 p.m. at Houston Motorsports Park. Uh, Indy Cars was yesterday and today. and they're What? Ro- they're running Iowa. Yeah, they're running Iowa. C- Iowa, circle what, uh, around around, the, around the pig farms or Not, well, a circle track, just a just a mile and a half oval in Iowa. Where in Iowa? Des Moines. Well, outskirts of Des Moines. Des Moines. Mm-hmm. It's not Des Moines. Yes. My, oh yeah, yeah. My, my grandmother's history. my grandmother's was from. I still got cousins that live there in Iowa. It's all farming. You realize they only give me a certain amount of time to do this, and then they talk. <laughs> Uh, Hurry up. For- Almost out of time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Formula One uh, tomorrow is at the Hungaro Ring, and, and that's in Hungary. And then on uh, the 2nd of uh, August is going to be Silverstone at the British, British Grand Prix. Tomorrow is uh, Texas Motor Speedway for NASCAR, and they are going to allow fans in, a, a, a limited number of fans. And then on the 23rd is going to be the Kansas Speedway. Again, with a limited number of fans. Tomorrow, well, starting today and tomorrow is the Sebring International Raceway for IMSA. So uh, the Corvettes are going to be going for their 101st victory. The new C8s? The C8, yeah. It won its 100th victory for Corvette uh, at Daytona two weeks ago. So their, their 100th IMSA they victory. Have, they have uh, on the new C8. Well, no, of Corvette. Oh, the C8 won the 100th, which was the first race the C8 won. Okay. It's only the second race they ran because they ran the 24th race Daytona. I was going to say. And then uh, also tomorrow is going to be uh, again at Indianapolis with NHRA. So they're doing their And two- they've canceled Brainerd and they canceled Denver this week. Right. And that, what a shame that is because Brainerd's a fun place to go and Denver's a new challenge every time they show up. And so they just added another one onto Indianapolis. And everybody says, well, why Indianapolis? Well, first of all, it's an NHRA-owned and operated track. And, and second all of all, all, there. All, well, almost all the teams are there. I know that John Force Racing, well, I don't know. I haven't looked with my own two eyes. But I understand that uh, his great big facility there is vacant and weeds are growing up in the parking lot. I wonder what's going on. I, nobody's talking. No, nobody's talking. And um, it's probably a good thing because... It has to do with money, and it obviously money is sponsorship. Mm-hmm. And so what's going to happen with the sport? Nobody seems yeah, to know. Hard well, to say. Between Force and, uh, and uh, um, oh, who's that? Um, Force. Oh. Schumacher? Or? Schumacher and uh, Connie Coletta. You know, if those three teams pull out of NHRA, mm-hmm. they're done. Well, done. And, is, and Force it, pulling out is a problem. 
it, it, it definitely is a problem. I don't think he's going to be pulling out forever, but I think it's going to change his setup, and he may announce his retirement because, you know, he's old. He's older than me. I resemble that is remark. He? Oh, yes, yeah. he is. He's Dang, set, I didn't yeah. think anybody was that old. John's 74. All righty, well, uh, that's going to pretty much do it for this portion of the uh, In Wheel Time. Uh, of Mike's, Mike's time on the show. And Mike's right? time on the show. Say Just goodbye, mute. and uh, we'll take care of him during this. It's 4 a.m., Monday, and you're literally sucking baby snot through a tube because she's congested. Man, that's love. And if you love her that much, love her enough to make sure she's buckled in the right car seat. To make sure your child's in the right seat for their age and size, visit NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Show them you love them. Keep them safe. Visit NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Is your business or company looking to stand out in a crowded advertising market? Looking to reach the real auto enthusiast? Well, you found it. You're listening or watching in real time, and so are your fellow enthusiasts. The In Wheel Time Car Show now reaches half a million, and we can put together a marketing plan that will engage them in your product, business, or service. To get the tires rolling, just shoot us an email to our marketing director, Jeff Zekin. His address is jeff at inwheeltime.com. Well, howdy, everybody, and welcome to In Wheel Time, the most popular live weekly award-winning car talk show, along with Mike Out of This World Mars and King Conrad DeLong. I'm Dodd Armstrong. So glad you could join us. It's a Bronco day. Uh, we've uh, kind of shooed away. Well, actually, they shooed themselves away. That would be the EV people because uh, apparently the coronavirus has uh, run everybody out of business uh, in, the EV, in the EV world. The, the power is on, but the lights are off. I've been thinking of that one. Yeah, since he's been working on that one. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and several of them said it was the cheap gas for the last couple of years. Just well, that that makes sense. I mean, uh, I, let's see, uh, was it dollar sixty nine a gallon? I think. Now? Yeah, I've seen. I saw one seventy nine yesterday. Uh, yeah. So it changed changed the landscape, but I, I think we're good to go. Whenever we get ready to do this in a couple of weeks, we'll be good. He, he says we're going to do it in a couple of weeks, like these people are going to be back in business in two weeks. Okay. No, no, no. I found the survivors, the, uh, the strong survivors. Yeah, that, that have no wallet left because they have uh, actually funding their own. <laughs> they <thing>. will survive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sounds like a Donna Summer song, doesn't it? Something like that. It was. All right. <laughs> so this show is devoted to Broncos because it was the debut this week of the 2021 Bronco and Bronco Sport. And uh, we talked last uh, segment about the new Bronco with the head of uh, Bronco Marketing, the head of the Bronco department there at Ford. And this time we're going to go back in time and talk to the president of the Lone Star Early Bronco Club. His name is Mike Clouds. Mike, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are y'all doing? Well, good. Uh, So, Mike, early Bronco Club, uh, 66, 67, 68, all the way up there to uh, the early 70s, or actually the late 70s. So how in the world do you get these things to survive? Because, you know, from my knowledge, cars in that era really didn't do too well when it came to rust. And I would imagine that you probably deal with that in in, in restoring uh, Broncos of that generation. Do you not? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, believe it or not, a lot of guys in the club are, are excellent at restoring these old Broncos, but uh, with the popularity in recent years, uh, now complete bodies are actually available uh, on the market. So, N- New say, reproduction bodies? Absolutely. Wow, I didn't know that. No, uh-uh. So we now have some insight into the gentleman that we talked to last Seth, hour, yeah, Seth. The CEO yeah, CEO of Gateway Bronco. So, so in other words, that you and I can go and order a complete brand new body. Yes, there's multiple vendors that are selling complete uh, bodies. Sheet metal you can just sit right on the old Bronco frame. Wow! And that's because the old sheet metal generally you can listen to it <laughs> rust. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, if you don't have the frame, can you get that too? I was going to tell you absolutely. There are several wonderful vendors out there that offer um, extremely nice frames 
uh, from kind of basic to extreme, extreme designs, uh, a lot of technology built into them. So it's basically a kit car. Yeah, but all you need is a VIN tag, and you can have a brand new Bronco early generation. Well, it, I, would, I would imagine you could apply for that, too, uh, as, a, as a home built. I would imagine. I think that the I, state of Texas uh, has a, that program. At any rate, where are you located, uh, Mike? I am in Huntsville, but we have chapters and members all over the great state of Texas and so, actually throughout the United States. Do you guys get together on a regular basis? I mean, in, in the different locations that you're in? We do. We have, uh, of course, the coronavirus kind of uh, oh, yeah. threw a monkey wrench in a lot of those plans, but uh, we do have meet and greets. Uh, we just had one last weekend in the Austin area. Uh, they had one Monday night for the reveal in Houston. Um, we have them um, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio. I mean, you name it. We have uh, what we call meet and greets. We also have several big events throughout the year. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. I, I was telling somebody earlier uh, on our show that it seems to me that with the debut of the brand new 2021 Bronco, that you guys should be seeing, and if you're not, you will be soon, uh, a, a boost in interest in the Broncos. Because I think there's been a long period of time that, you know, the interest has kind of waned. But all of this attention to the new Bronco makes people go, well, wait a minute. There used to be a 66 Bronco, a 67, a 69. And I don't think that a lot of people are really familiar with that body style. Well, of course, for me, being involved with the early Broncos for so long, and it, it involves so much of my life and our family's life, you're probably right. I don't see it because I'm so engulfed in it, but uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of uh, excitement right now with the Bronco, new and old. Uh, it is just, the Bronco has been very popular for several years now, and now it's just, it's crazy right now. Social media yeah. is just... And I want to say, in, 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 talking to Mike and, and uh, Todd and Seth and everything this week while we were learning, I I was totally shocked at this cult-like following this vehicle has because it's so low-key. I mean, it's like they all know about it. They all know who each other are. I mean, these all these people are on first-name basis with each other because they're a very close-knit community. But the rest of us... We don't know anything about it until now. Yeah, yeah, we didn't even know we didn't know that you existed. So when we decided to to talk to you guys, uh, uh, delve into the Bronco early Bronco clubs, we're thinking, well, are there such a thing? And then yeah. we, then we find you, and then come to find out, we, there there are hundreds of members uh, of your club. They've so they've even got a national organization. It's called the Bronco Nation, I think. Right, the Bronco Nation. Well, you know, it's interesting that you should say that because uh, what I learned with the new Bronco is is that Ford is actually involved in Bronco Nation, and they're also going to become more involved kind of along the lines of the Jeep Wrangler uh, organizations. They're going to actually have four, four actual off-road courses that Ford is going to back, so you'll be able to take your Bronco to these off-road courses under the banner of Ford Motor Company, which, which is really cool. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that you know all about that, and uh, you probably know these locations, but uh, there are four locations across the United States. I thought that that was really cool. Um, and this uh, the whole aftermarket thing is going to be a real boon to your era of Broncos because I think that everybody's going to say, well, wait a minute, we still got this huge, and I guess that you probably still have some sort of a go-to uh, place that you can get all of your parts and aftermarket parts with Bronco. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. We're very lucky. We have several great uh, vendors for the early Bronco. And uh, I mean, they're just, they support, actually support our club and other clubs and events throughout the country. We are very blessed to have the vendors that we have. Okay, so I want to know about your Bronco in particular. Give me the lowdown on it. Okay, well, our Bronco, the big green Bronco that we drive daily, uh, it's been stretched. It's stretched about 39 inches. Uh, they added a second more. second row of doors. Did you add a second <laughs> row of doors? Well, there is actually a second row, but there's no doors. Uh, 
It's, it's the wide open concept. It actually has what we call roadster inserts, what the original 66 uh, Bronco roadster came, came from the factory with, but it has two sets of those. Uh, and I've got a third row seat as well. Uh, the reason for that is we have three children and uh, they love everything Bronco and they love to ride. And, and actually our dog, Maggie, she likes to ride with us as well. Was your, was your truck at SEMA? My truck was not at SEMA. I was at SEMA, but the truck was not. Okay, because I, I, I seem to remember a truck somewhat similar to yours, and they talked about a third oh, row seat. Yes, believe me, that was a, there was a beautiful four-door uh, early Bronco there. Absolutely okay. beautiful, yes. So uh, do you drive yours frequently? I drive it almost every day. Uh, we, we actually rock crawl it. We trail it. Uh, this past summer, I had the privilege of driving to – Dearborn, Michigan, for a Bronco event. I drove from Texas all the way to Dearborn. No doors, no heat, no AC, nothing. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, clearly, uh, you you like the uh, the rugged outdoor lifestyle, and that'll certainly do it. <laughs> yeah, and so where are you going to go from here now? Uh, now with the, the the new Bronco is out, it, does it give you any ideas of any kind of modifications that you may want to make to yours? Man, I tell you what, it's. It, I'll be glad to to finally get get behind the wheel and and drive one and and look at all of it. Of course, we did. We we have reserved one. So of course you did. Yes. <laughs> just one. Uh, just one. <laughs> yes, sir. Just uh, one. Okay. Just one. But, uh, I will tell you this: that um, we're excited about it. Uh, and the thing about the early Broncos and what what makes them so unique is there's no two that are exactly the same. And when people say, well, I'm finally done with the restoration or whatever, they're never really done because they're always evolving. Technology comes out and we always find things that we want to do to them. Well, we are car guys and that's what we do is we fiddle around in the garage and you found this play with cars. Exactly. You found this new trinket that you want to put in the engine compartment or you got some new little gadget that you've got for the suspension that you want to bolt on. Whatever always, the case always may be. upgrading, never yeah. finished. Exactly. So what do you think about the thirty five inch tires on the new Bronco? Is that does that give you any incentive to go out and uh, maybe uh, do some modifications to get those to fit underneath yours? Well, actually, mine have already. I've already. I had 35s. I've. I've since upgraded to 37s. <laughs> but, of course. Yes, of course you did. You, you know, it's just. There you go. It's that process. You got to keep going. That, that's right. This process, and you guys get it because you're car guys, man. It's just so addictive. It's so fun. So how um, are how are 37s on the highway? Actually, on the, with with the extra uh, wheelbase, it's. It, my Bronco, our Bronco drives really good on the highway. Uh, what kind of what kind of air pressure do you run in them on the highway? About thirty five. Wow. Yeah, he doesn't drop the pressure till he goes rock climbing. Yeah, and then right. down to five or something. Yeah, wow. About twelve. Yeah. So, uh, well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And you, you say that there is a Houston chapter of uh, the uh, Lone Star Early Bronco Club. Absolutely, we have five chapters: Central, which is around Austin, and North which is Dallas, we have East, which is Houston area, South San Antonio area, and West, which is like Abilene area. Yeah, I posted up a, uh, a link on our Facebook page to your club as well. Absolutely. Thank you all for doing that. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Bronco Nation as well. Bronco Nation. Here, here. Yeah, exactly. Well, be sure and share us uh, amongst your Bronco friends and stay in touch with us. We want to uh, we want to know your thoughts when we get closer to the debut. And uh, as we were talking to the Ford guy, uh, he said that uh, apparently the 2021 Sport model will be out uh, first yeah, before the end of the year. Before the end of the year. So we've got that to talk. So when that comes out, you're going to have to uh, get together with us so and get your take on that. Absolutely. Thanks Mike. for the invitation, guys. Yeah, thank you, Mike Clouds. We really yeah, appreciate it. President much. of the Lone Star Early Bronco Club. Great to talk to you. Thanks again. All right, time now for our Jeep Trails feature, ironically enough. <laughs> uh, In Will Time's <laughs> weekly look into the world of Jeeping, and Mr. Mars has that for us. So one of the things about, just like we were talking about, the, the whole outdoor lifestyle, the, the doors coming off, the windows coming out, uh, Jeep has been known 
you know, they kind of got away from it and made it a little more difficult because of uh, safety rules, but they've got it back down to where it's basically four bolts now, and you can fold down the windshield mm -hmm. on the Jeep Wrangler and on the Gladiator. Well, but what do you do with it once you got it folded down? I mean, if you're really going to drive it, you got this windshield out there bouncing out. I remember my buddy Larry's, his old one, we'd go down the beach and hit a rut or something, that thing would bounce, we were afraid we were going to break it. Got an answer for that. Strap it. Windshield tie down straps. You can yep. get them from Jeep. Go to Jeep.com and you can go in there and uh, once you've got it laid down there, and there's a little video that shows you how to lay it down so that you don't break anything, and then it straps in there and it ties down and it's really cool oh, on it how it does like, it. It sounds like it's going to break it. Got an answer for that. Strap it. Windshield tie down straps. You can yep. get them from Jeep. Go to Jeep.com. And you can go in there and... More of In Wheel Time online, including the Mystery Garage, after this quick break. When might you be buzzed? When you suddenly love everything. You guys! I love this song! I love these nachos. I love our kickball league! Ugh! I love this guy! What's your name? You know what I'd love? A ride when it's time to head out. If you see a buzzed warning sign, call for a ride when it's time to go home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. I love your car. Is this real leather? A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hey, thanks for joining us here at In Wheel Time. If you'd like to get in touch with us at any time, just shoot us an email. The address is info at inwheeltime.com. And you can also get a hold of us through your Facebook squeezings. Squeezing? Squeezing. I don't know. That that, that word didn't just, make sense. I know, but it, it, it came to mind. You like it's, saying that word. I do like squeezings. Yeah. But like me, I like the word schmutz. 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 It's Yiddish for something dirty. Okay. And sticky. Well, <laughs> speaking of which, I found us a before and after garage in the mystery garage today. And I think that you're really going to appreciate this. So the cluttered mess uh, is probably like most people have. Trunk of my car. That would be the picture on the top. And if, if you're sitting at home and watching the show, you can kind of zoom that up. But at any rate, so notice that um, it's one of those garages that was never painted. Uh, from the, from and, and you could tell that the sheetrock is drywalled, but the tape marks are still there. Right. And the sheetrock is kind of dingy and it's, you know, turning brownish and <clears throat> they've got a refrigerator in there, which, by the way, is a terrible idea to put a refrigerator in a garage because the refrigerator has to run pretty much all the time. It's a very expensive. If you want to have a refrigerator in the garage, Go to home De wherever an appliance store and get one of those little bitty refrigerators, the small ones that don't have a freezer in it. Why? Because the freezers do not have an automatic defroster, so you have to defrost it. I know this from experience because we got those out at the airport, and just because nobody ever defrosts it, <laughs> you can the, never get the ice out of it because it's all frozen in there. The, the, the little freezer part of it yeah. builds up with ice to the point you can't even get your hand in no. there, and then it'll eventually push the door open, and it makes it even worse. And then it defrosts. <laughs> and then it starts defrosting well, I, on got the carpet. A, I got a big freezer in my garage, standalone freezer, but I have a, a fan on it blowing air over the back of it all the time because my garage is hot. Yeah. And you think that and, that's going to help it? And Angela keeps it clean, not me. I know. And that wouldn't be you. Anyway, so there's a refrigerator in there. Obviously, if you're going to do a garage makeover, the first thing you need to do is get rid of the old refrigerator. And if you have to have one in the garage, then put a small one in there. Notice that uh, he's got the shelves on the top, uh, on the left-hand side, on the top there. Uh, it, Storage but, but boxes. The, but the biggest thing to me is, is how hard is it? to get a gallon of paint, paint the walls, and then paint the floor. Look at the bottom picture. Same house, kind of the same angle, 
But look what a little coat of paint will do, not only on the walls, but also on the floor. And I'm sure that the ceiling is done as well. It, it looks and like it. And a place for the kids to hang their ba- backpacks and yep. jackets. And those kind of shelves, you know, are available either online oh, at yeah. Walmart. Super cheap. Or, yes, very cheap, or at uh, Home Depot. Um, and you'll also notice that the storage area over on the left, it's the same storage area he just painted the wood, the raw wood. It's the same shelf. You see that? hmm And you'll notice that he's actually kind of halfway there because of the tubs that are over there. The garbage cans are now outside the garage, clearly. That'll make the Homeowners Association happy. I, you know, <laughs> I... I have to tell you that I did that uh, many years. I hide mine behind the cars here. You can't see it from the street. And what I did is I put a fence in front of the fence on the side of the house to store my two garbage cans. Yeah. So you, there is a shade, basically. Right. And you can also do it with, uh, you can also do it, well, the, the door is painted black after they finish the door. But at any rate, um, And just like Don, look at the license plates above the door, and we have these wonderful license plates here that you've collected uh, through the years. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, George Skelton mentioned that. He's mentioned that we he noticed that we put the license. Did you see the story I posted about George sending the license plates to the? Yes, and George uh, was kind enough to send me actually the video that he referred to uh, of the Corvette. George, you're a good man. He is a good man, a great guy, and uh, and a good friend of the show. So, at any rate, that's today's Mystery Garage. All right. This week in automotive history, Mr. DeLong. In 1904, driver Harry Harkness won the first Mount Washington hill climb. Mount Washington is the big, tall mountain in New Hampshire. And uh, in his 60-horsepower Mercedes-Benz, it took him 24 minutes to go up the hill. The Mercedes-Benz in 1904 was $18,000. I couldn't imagine what that would be worth today. Millions. In 1934, Harry uh -uh, Ames filed a patent application for retractable headlamps. And then the first time retractable headlamps were brought to production was on the Cord 810. I thought it was pretty cool, and then came back on uh, on Corvettes again in uh, in uh, '63. I think is when they came back to market. In 1935, the first automatic parking meter, the Parco meter, was in <laughs> was installed in Oklahoma City. In 1995, on this day, Chrysler Corporation opened a car dealership in downtown Hanoi, Vietnam. And a week later, they opened up a second one in in, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So basically 20 years after the United States left Vietnam, Chrysler was opening up dealerships. I thought that was a pretty pretty interesting story. In 1955, the Carmen Ghia Coupe was unveiled in Westphalia, Germany. So the term Westphalia Vans came from Germany. That's the name of a city there in Germany. I didn't know that. I didn't either. Donald, in 1964, Sir Donald Campbell, yeah, this is the history part of it, right? Uh, Sir Donald Campbell, the son of uh, Britain's most prolific land speed wrecker, Sir Malcolm Campbell, drove the Bluebird four, four-wheel drive uh, gasoline-powered land speed record to 403 miles an hour on a wheel-driven vehicle, and I think that record was just recently broken. And then in 1978, on this day, Ford Motor Company chairman Henry Ford II fires Lee Iacocca, the father of the Mustang and the father of the Bronco, uh, and ending uh, a tumultuous time with Lee Iacocca and the Ford folks. And then Lee went on to uh, Chrysler. To, to a tumultuous time over at Chrysler. No, he, he saved Chrysler <laughs> he saved by Chrysler. far. And he also was the chairman of the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. The mini, the minivan and the K-car. Well, the yes. K-car first. And then the minivan was actually the first Chrysler minivan was built on a K-car platform. Unbelievable. Yeah, great stuff. All right. Today's automotive news is coming up next on In Wheel Time. GTG, BRB, OMW, be there in a few. You may think that these kinds of texts are fine because of their length, and you can easily send them at a stoplight. But no, answering one text can take your attention away from the road for five seconds. And traveling at 55 miles an hour, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Make good decisions. Don't text and drive. 
Visit StopTextStopRex.org. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Texas Truck Works is your go-to truck customizer. From mild-to-wild lift kits, custom wheels and steering and handling enhancements, to the best personal and commercial wraps, Texas Truck Works delivers. Let Texas Truck Works founder Scott Stevens help you get the most out of your truck or Jeep. Texas Truck Works has decades of customizing experience, including power adders and complete engine swaps. Let the Texas Truck Works team design an upgrade plan that fits your budget. Get truck attitude today at TexasTruckWorks.com. Welcome back to the In Wheel Time Car Show as we uh, start to wrap up uh, today's show. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, the creek don't rise. Isn't that the saying? Isn't that how that goes? Lord willing, the creek Lord don't rise. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Okay. It the Lord like wasn't willing back, back in Harvey, though. No, he was not. <laughs> All right. Uh, time now for this hour's news from around the globe. And we'll start here in Texas because apparently Texas is moving forward, uh, forward with efforts to woo Tesla and lure its next electric vehicle factory after the county that's home to the state capitol signed off on a tax relief package. Commissioners in Travis County voted Tuesday to approve a 70%, 70% property tax rebate on the first $1.1 billion the company invests in a site near Austin. Come on, Elon! The abatement is worth at least $13.9 million. Not a bad payday if you can get it. No, uh-huh. and, and considering the amount of uh, people it's going to put to work and the property value increase, it'll pay for itself. Yeah. Uh, the areas of Austin and Tulsa, Oklahoma, are the finalists for landing in the facility where Tesla plans to build the Cybertruck pickup that CEO Elon first unveiled late last year. Uh, Tesla has told Travis County that its planned factory will eventually employ 5,000 full-time workers with an average sal- salary of roughly $47,000 a year. At least half of those will be county residents. They'll need a glass store right next door because isn't that the one where he was introducing it and, and said how bulletproof the glass was and broke it when he <laughs> threw the ball <laughs> exactly. yeah, with a, with a, Yeah, some sort of rock or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah there's I can't that. imagine why he's looking at Tulsa. Uh, I like Tulsa. Don't get me wrong, but I just it, compared to Austin – yeah, I know. No, no Austin is definitely a fit for Tesla. Uh, speaking of Tesla, they have cut the price of its Model Y crossover by $3,000 less than four months after starting sales. Starting price now $51,190, including a $1,200 destination and documentation fee, according to Tesla's website. Electric car maker has been charging $54,190 since beginning deliveries in mid-March. Nissan's next, next electric vehicle, the long-awaited Aria, The crossover is a technological powerhouse with performance chops. Nissan North America says the U.S. range is estimated at 300 miles for that. Honda remains committed to its core car models in the U.S., but can no longer make an economic case for the Fit subcompact, Civic Coupe, and six-speed manual version of the Accord sedan, all of which are being discontinued after this model year. That's big news right there. Yes, it is. Uh Uh-huh. And Carlos Gosen. East. (laughs) Insists. <laughs> Where is he at now? Insists his wife and four adult children played no part in his dramatic escape from Japan in a crate that was smuggled aboard a private plane with him in it. But according to evidence gathered by Japanese prosecutors, Gosen spent some of his final hours in Tokyo with at least one family member, his daughter, Maya, 27, who works in California. The two had lunch together the day he fled before she delivered luggage to a hotel where she met with one of Gosen's alleged accomplices. Those details were included among hundreds of pages of travel documents, witness statements, and security camera images in Japan's formal request (laughs) to the U.S. government for the extradition of the two Americans accused of engineering the escape, former Green Beret Michael Taylor and his son, Peter. It's a mess. I'm telling you, the movie is going to be fabulous. And, be and be I right. think that that's going to be our next venture. We are going to decide to go ahead and get in the movie business because I want to be a part of that. <laughs> so there's that. I don't know what I've done here, but apparently I've done something that uh, I shouldn't have done. But I do want to uh, tell you that that is all for today's In Wheel Time program. We thank you so much for joining us today. 
Uh, I don't know why it's not playing what it's supposed to be playing, but it's not playing it, so... Can, can you hum it? <laughs> There's that. I, lo I love computers, don't you? But anyway, that's it for today's In Wheel Time Car Show. Hey, when you're on Facebook, please give us a like and tell your friends about us. You'll get Conrad's unicorn hunting features along with all things automotive all week long. The In Wheel Time Car Show streams on Facebook, YouTube, and InWheelTime.com. Podcasts available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, iHeart Podcast, Google Podcast, and Podcast Addict. Special thanks to all of our guests today. The Inwheel Time Chief Engineer is the fabulous David Ainsley, our video and sales director is Man About Town, Jeffrey Zekin. Inwheel Time Car Show is produced, written, and directed by yours truly. We'll try not to mess it up again next week. For booking agent and podcast massager, Mike out of this world, Mars, and his royalty, King Conrad DeLong, I'm Don Armstrong saying so long for now. Hey, we'll hope you'll join us live every Saturday, 10 a.m. to noon, right here on the Smoke and Mirrors Network. Thanks for being a part of the In Wheel Time family. <laughs> Enjoy your weekend. Mask up. Be fabulous. Wash those nasty hands and stay sanitary like you know you want to do. Goodbye for now.